Well, overnight, Russian warships and a nuclear-powered submarine arrived in Cuba, 90 miles from Florida's coast. Someone called John F. Kennedy and seek his wisdom if you can find him. Meanwhile, Senator Lindsey Graham this weekend finally told the truth and admitted the real reason we are sending billions of dollars to Ukraine and training and weapons. Listen. Either we're going to help Ukraine or we're not. It's now time to give them the F-16s, let them fly the planes, long-range artillery to hit targets inside of Russia. They're sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals in, in Ukraine. They could be the richest country in all of Europe. I don't want to give that money and those assets to Putin to share with China. If we help Ukraine now, they can become the best business partner we ever dreamed of. That 10 to $12 trillion of critical mineral assets could be yeah. used by Ukraine and the West not given to Putin and China. This is a very big deal how Ukraine ends. Mm -hmm. Let's help them win a war we can't afford to lose. Let's find a solution to this war. But they're sitting on a gold mine to give Putin 10 or $12 trillion of critical minerals that yep. he will share with uh, China is ridiculous. So, of course, it's not about the Ukrainian people at all. It never was about the Ukrainian people. It's about $10 trillion of resources. We don't care about the Ukrainians. It's about the minerals. It's about the resources that we plan to plunder uh, and steal from them, of course. And Russia is getting in the way to our strategic plans there. So why are they playing with potential nuclear war over minerals and resources? Our next guest is holding a special emergency press conference this week in Washington, D.C. It's called The Danger of Nuclear War is Real and It Must Be Stopped. That is former U.N. weapons inspector Scott Ritter is going to be at that D.C. event, and he joins me now. Scott, great to see you. Oh, good to see you. So we'll talk about the event in just a minute and get your perspective on that. But first, your response to Lindsey Graham this weekend making a number of different statements. So Lindsey Graham admitting the truth, 600,000 Ukrainians, it's not really about them at all. It's about our ability to get our hands on $10 trillion of minerals and resources. Well, Lindsey Graham has been around a long time, and um, he's old enough to remember that uh, this has always been the American policy regarding post-Soviet Russia. Um, the United States, from the moment the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, viewed Russia as a landmass that was too big, um, had too much wealth, too much mi uh, minerals, um, would make any emerging Russian state self-sufficient uh, with the capability of not being totally subservient to the West. And it was always the policy objective of the United States to ensure that Russia could never again rise up and challenge the United States globally like the Soviet Union did. And so the policy of the United States was always to weaken Russia politically, economically, and uh, geographically, to break Russia up into constituent parts so that you couldn't have a singular entity possessing all of this capability. Um, so the Ukrainian conflict is an extension of this. You know, if you go back to the period of time before the Maidan revolution, uh, the Maidan coup in 2014, when uh, Viktor Yanukovych and even uh, the presidents before that um, were desirous of joining the European Union, um, the reason why they didn't join the European Union is because in the post-Soviet era, in the 90s and afterwards, Ukraine had a special economic relationship with Russia. And this relationship allowed Ukraine to trade with Russia, to have uh, industrial capabilities that continued to feed into the Russian system, similar to what had happened in the Soviet times when it was a singular economy. Um, and if Ukraine joined the European Union, then Russia would have to put up a barrier uh, because you can't allow an EU nation to exploit Ukraine to poach the Russian economy. So Russia told Ukraine, you have a choice. You can continue to have this great trading relationship with us, or you can join the European Union, have a great trading relationship with them, but you can't have both. And Ukraine made the decision that it was just too expensive for them to walk away. We couldn't accept that because even though Ukraine was an independent sovereign state, Russia continued to be able to access Ukrainian resources 
Um, and we didn't want Russia to access those resources. We wanted those resources for ourselves. So one of the main reasons to strip Ukraine away from Russia was always about the resources. This is why Hunter Biden worked for Burisma, a you know energy uh, you know exchange company. Uh, this is why uh, American politicians have always had um, a unique uh, attraction to Ukraine because they could sit on boards, they could sit uh, associate with companies that were dealt with energy. This is about America siphoning the uh, economic wealth of Ukraine away from U Ukraine and away from Russia. Lindsey Graham has finally told the truth about what the American policy with Ukraine is all. It's never been about democracy. Ukraine's never been a democracy. It's never been about helping the Ukrainian people. We don't care about them. I've been saying this since day one. You can't claim to care about a people whom you allow their manhood to be slaughtered on the battlefield, allow their people to be dispersed. This is about Ukrainian resources. That's it. And Lindsey Graham is basically saying that He's willing to let Ukrainians die to the last Ukrainian so that America can gain access and control of Ukraine's mineral wealth. How close are we to nuclear war? You're about to head to Washington, D.C. and headline this event down there, be one of the speakers uh, as part of this big event, this press conference. And it seems like Russian President Putin has made it explicitly clear that all of this sort of training and all of these other high Mars attacks and things are not okay. But once that crosses the line into cruise missiles, once attackums or storm shadows start coming across the border, it's game over. Uh, how close are we to that moment? And when people throw around the idea of nuclear war, are they just being hyperbolic or are we there? Are we at this sort of Cuban missile crisis moment right now? Well, we're, we're past the Cuban missile crisis. Uh, what people don't understand the Cuban Missile Crisis is that, you know, yes, the, the, the Soviets put missiles into Cuba, but the confrontation was timed to the arrival of Soviet ships to a line that Kennedy had drawn in the uh, Caribbean. And so we had this clock that was running down to that that gave people a moment to look at, consider insanity prevailed on both sides. Um, we're not, we don't have a line we have a push of the button. We are one attackums launch away from general nuclear conflict with the Soviet with Russia, meaning that the Ukrainians who have attackums missiles now, if they attack the wrong target inside Russia, this could lead to a general nuclear war. Um, and 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 it's that. And so what what I'm trying to tell the audience here is that. For whatever reason, we have allowed, we have passed down to the Ukrainians the ability to start a, a general nuclear war. Until we take the attackums out of their control, until we take the scalp missile, the storm shadow out of their control, we have pushed down to Ukraine the ability to create the conditions for a nuclear conflict. Now, fortunately, there's an adult in the room, and his name is Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, every St. Petersburg International Economic Forum in recent history, Putin has said things that the world should listen to. And this one was no different. What he said is that Russia understands the insanity that the West is involved in. And so he has put in additional interim measures. He has created room for escalation management. For instance, he said, if you attack us with high Mars or attack them, um, we may not go straight to nuclear war. We may choose to attack you using our precision weapons that we'll turn over to a third party proxy just to keep this game of escalation going. Now, a lot of people heard that and went, oh, how provocative can he be? And I heard that and I said, thank God he just put an escalation control mechanism in place. Um, and he also talked down. He said, yes, we have nuclear weapons. Yes, we have a doctrine. And yes, that doctrine can be implemented and will be implemented if need to be. But we're not there yet. He, he brought it down. He brought the temperature down, everything down. He's doing everything right to manage this. The question is, are we in the West listening? And are we going to respond in kind to de-escalate? 
And I'm afraid I'm not hearing that from the West right now. Maybe we can, but this is one of the reasons for this press conference is to drive home the absolute imperative uh, for the United States to take a leadership role in de-escalating the Ukrainian conflict. I mean, it seems like at every turn, unless I'm wrong, it seems like at every turn they keep trying to call his bluff to see if he's actually telling the truth. And at every turn, they've been rebuffed. So now he's saying, I'm going to use third party proxies, just like you guys are doing. I'm going to, that's, it seems like a great idea. So I'm going to provide weapons to these third party proxies. And do you want to test that? Do you want to see if we're being truthful? Do you want to see if I'm bluffing here? Um, first of all, is he bluffing? And second of all, what particular third parties would the United States maybe want to provoke and try? Would it be Yemen? Would it be Syria? Where do you think these proxies would be located that we would want to test this out, this theory? I mean, that's a, that's a Russian foreign policy, national security policy prerogative. But I'll say this, a, um, a Russian ship has um, arrived in a Cuban port. On board that ship are Zircon hypersonic missiles that are in range of the United States. And the United States has nothing that can shoot them down. There's also a Russian nuclear-powered missile, cruise missile, uh, submarine in the same area. The weapons on board these two ships have the ability to take the East Coast off of the map of the United States. Um, that's with, of course, nuclear weapons, but they're also precision-guided. Um, how does it feel to be in the White House knowing that you're 12 minutes away from dying and there's nothing anybody can do to save you? The Secret Service can't you get you out of the White House fast enough. And it's not a nuclear explosion. It's a Zircon missile that's going to come in and hit the White House. It can't be stopped. If the president's in the White House and the Russians decide to kill him, he's a dead man. Anybody in the United States on the East Coast is a dead man if the Russians decide to kill him. You see, that's what we have done to the Russians. We have them living, living under that. You know, every morning that um, you know, Putin goes to work, he's 12 minutes away from dying if the United States or, uh, you know, Europe wanted to send precision guided missiles into uh, into the Kremlin. Uh, and in the West, we, we seem to think that's OK. Well, guess what? Russia just flipped the script. And if the Russians are who I think they are, I'm imagining that there might be some um, cargo on these ships that stays behind in Cuba. Hmm. And when these ships visit Venezuela, there's some cargo that will stay behind in Venezuela so that the United States will live in perpetual fear of Russian hypersonic missiles, conventionally armed. I don't think the Russians will deploy nuclear weapons into uh, Cuba or um, Venezuela. Conventionally armed, they can't be stopped. There's nothing America could do to stop. And if the United States seeks to strike them, understand these weapons now will strike America. Uh, we've taken away, Russia is going to remove the ability of the United States to attack Venezuela, attack Cuba with no consequence. Um, again, it changes the entire paradigm of, of what we're doing here. So, and yeah, I think leverage, Yemen is a, Yeah, what leverage do we have anymore? I mean, this is the, right, we've, we've lost all leverage. They're not using the US dollar anymore. <laughs> what, I mean, what leverage do they have? We're gonna, you know, John F. Kennedy on the phone with Khrushchev, can you please remove these missiles and we'll work out a deal, but there's no deal anymore, right? Not right now until, I mean, the, look, the Russians, again, I can't speak on their behalf. I can just say this as a student of Russian history. Um, they do not want to live in a world that is in a perpetual state of chaos, a perpetu perpetual state of conflict. Uh, when Putin gave his address at the plenary at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, he started out not with the global geopolitical crisis. He started out with the economy. This is Russia's focus on strengthening the Russian economy, strengthening Russian economic ties with the majority of the nations in the world who are working with the Russians, uh, preparing for the BRICS conference in October. This is, this is the preference. And Russia has always said that they're willing to sit down with a genuine negotiating partner and come up with an arrangement that de-escalates what Russia is doing now is putting chips on the table. You see, in the past, the United States said, well, we, we won't allow you to talk about this. We won't allow you to talk about that. Like, you can't talk about 
nuclear capable aircraft on an aircraft carrier when you talk about nuclear weapons or is it like why it's a nuclear weapon on an aircraft carrier no you're not allowed to talk about that you can't talk about the nato nuclear arsenal because Russians are like why it's against no you can't talk about that the russians now have chips on the table they have nuclear weapons in belarus they're going to have precision guided munitions around the world and so the next time when the united states and europe eventually do agree to come to the table it's going to be a completely different dialogue and the united states and europe are going to have to retrograde and that's necessary we have to back away from the russian frontier in order for there to be peace and stability in the past we refused to discuss it because we we thought we were coming in with the strongest hand well this ukrainian conflict has strengthened russia's hand uh, not just in the region but globally, and it'll be a completely different dialogue, but it'll be one that the United States, frankly speaking, has no choice but to enter into. You, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this. Um, about a week ago, a little over a week ago, we had the, the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. You were set to attend. You were flying in. You go to the airport. And then we learned, um, and you made this public, that uh, you were unceremoniously uh, kicked off the aircraft and had your American passport taken out of your hands, I suppose, and were not able to go to Russia after all. Uh, it sounds like something out of North Korea, but when I read, I couldn't believe this, but no, this is happening in the United States of America. So could you tell our audience what exactly happened to you and have you gotten any further insight from the authorities that took your passport? Well, I mean, I wasn't yanked off the airplane. I was actually getting on the airplane when I was pulled out of the line, literally as I'm crossing the threshold by three armed uh, Customs and Border Protection officers who um, asked my name, asked to see my passport, and then told me that uh, the state that they were taking, seizing control of my passport um, on the orders of the State Department. Um, I asked for any evidence of this. They said they only, they have these orders. I said, well, what's the next step? They said, we don't know. You have to contact the state department. And I have been contacting the state department ever since, and I've gotten no answer. Now I've heard from, you know, media sources saying that the state department has said that uh, they revoked my passport. So it isn't just a seizure. It's a revocation of my passport. Um, but you know, the other than that, they haven't given a specific reason why. Let me just say this, that that passport was issued to me in, um, in May of 2021. Um, I've taken that passport on two previous trips to Russia with no problems. I've traveled to other foreign countries, France, Switzerland, no problems whatsoever. The decision to revoke my passport at this time was a deliberate decision made by the State Department to prevent me from traveling to uh, the St. Peter's International, St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. And just so people are clear, I was also scheduled to travel to the Moscow International Security Conference in August. Um, apparently there's somebody in Washington, DC that doesn't want me to uh, be going to Russia attending these uh, conferences. They also terminated a 40 day uh, program of work in Russia where I had a documentary film crew. We were going to be uh, traveling to different cities, meeting Russians, capturing this experience, turning it into a movie to serve as the antidote to the poison of uh, Russophobia. Uh, I think these three projects in, in, in totality scared the crap out of somebody in the State Department, and they took this extraordinary measure. Um, I will get my passport back. That's a guarantee. Um, when is a different question. The work that I had planned is disrupted. It isn't going to happen. Um, I doubt I'll be able to travel to uh, Russia in, in August, but I will get back to Russia. They can't stop this work. Uh, educating the American people about the uh, reality of Russia, the Russian people, the need for dialogue, the need to seek peaceful outcomes instead of confrontation is far too important uh, than to allow the, the State Department to play stupid games. And that's what this is. It's literally the stupidest of games being played by the State Department. Hmm. I, I, yes, exactly. Well, we hope it, it happens sooner rather than later that you can continue your work. You're going to be in Washington, D.C. this week for this big event. Where can people tune they in? They can't stop that. And they can't stop that. That's <laughs> in their own backyard. I mean, they can try. They can certainly try to put up fences. We'll, yeah. we'll see. Maybe I'm banned on traveling on Amtrak. We'll find out. <laughs> 
like oh yeah you'll be yeah you know, you'll have to do it from your home so can you quickly tell us about the event that the anti-nuclear event the anti-nuclear war event which maybe they'll try to stop that because they desperately want it seems to to go to nuclear war well i'm going to make two announcements actually there's there's the press conference on wednesday uh, and i'll be there together with um uh, Senator Black from Virginia and Ray McGovern, um, former CIA analyst, and uh, 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 Helga LaRouche from the Schiller Institute. Uh, Diane Sayre may be there. Uh, she's a senatorial candidate in New York running against uh, Christine Gillibrand. But the purpose is to you know, put a marker on the table that we live in very dangerous times um, and that nuclear, the potential of nuclear war is real. Um, you know, I've been accused by some people lately of, you know, fear mongering. Oh, you're just trying to make Americans scared. You're damn right. I am. You're damn right. I'm trying to make you scared and you better be scared. You better be scared. You should be scared to death about the policies of our government and how they could be marching us into a war. Again, this isn't going to be the Cuban missile crisis where you get to stare at a map and count, you know, the hours until the ships reach a line. No, no, no. One attack comes launch away from a war in that who controls that attack and launch is in America. It's a Ukrainian. That's how insane this is. And I'll make a second announcement. On September 28th, Gerald Solante is ho hosting a, um, an event in Kingston, New York. It's an event which is going to, according to Gerald, save democracy, save America, save the world. It's an event that's going to focus on nuclear, the danger of nuclear war and how to wake up uh, American politicians on the eve of a national election. It's an event that um, we'd like to, because I'm, I'm working with him on this, uh, you know how they talked about Woodstock and how uh, they shut down the throughway. So many people came to Woodstock. Yeah. America, yeah. we need to shut down the throughway on September 28th. We need millions of people, millions of people to flood Kingston, New York in a signal to the United States politicians that we will not stand idly while they lead us down the path of nuclear destruction. We need to turn it into the biggest anti-nuclear uh, weapons demonstration in the history of the United States. And I, I remind people, they say, well, what good are demonstrations? Sometimes I say that myself. In June of 1982, a million people converged in Central Park in New York City for an anti-nuclear war rally. The president of the United States at the time was Ronald Reagan, an arch conservative anti-communist. That rally woke him up to the absolute necessity of arms control. And five years later, he signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that sent people like myself into the Soviet Union to get rid of nuclear weapons. That's the direction we need to be heading as a nation. So on Wednesday, I'm going to scare you. But on September 28th, I want everybody to come together if we're still alive and take control of this agenda. If you feel powerless, if you're saying, what can I do? What can I, I just told you what to do. Show up in Kingston, New York, September 28th, and send a signal that you are not going to stand by idly while our politicians take us down the path of nuclear conflict. That whoever wants to be elected has to address the nuclear issue now, not later. See if we can get Bob Dylan there. Wouldn't that be impressive? That would um, be something. <laughs> I would love to go. I'd love to, uh, you know, be able to cover it here on Redacted. Uh, I'd love to be able to give as much voice as we possibly can to that event uh, as we get closer to September. So consider yourself invited. <laughs> would we'll, we'll love it. Would we'll love it. Gerald uh, Gerald Salenti is a good friend. I'm a good friend of the show, and I love his passion and, of course, what he stands for as well. So this is in perfect alignment with our message here on this show. Um, we will be all over it, Scott. Great to see you as always. Um, glad you're safe and sound, and we will be following the events in Washington, D.C. this week as well. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.